us tonight. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, that he thought us worthy enough to call us, to save us, and to put us in his plan. <clears throat> Why? I don't know. God could have certainly chosen better than me and probably better than you as well, but you are, we're his first choice. So with that in mind, we thank you. We're going to be in the Word of God tonight talking about freedom from fear because we live in a pretty fearful time. We're going to be in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 1. 2 Timothy, chapter number 1, if you will. You find your place. And I'm going to read the first nine verses of this chapter in your presence and ask God's guidance as he leads us through this time. If you find your place, if you would stand with us out of respect to reading of God's word, begin reading read 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Let's begin at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in, thy, in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and then in thy mother Eunice, but I am also persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Let's bow here for a word of prayer. Lord, it's Pretty assuring to know that before the world began, you already had your plan and purpose and in place. Father, it seems so many times like I've messed your plan up, and but God, little do I know that's part of your plan too. So thank you, Jesus, for just accepting us, even in spite of our failures. Have mercy on our soul. Forgive us when we fail you, and forgive us for anything that would prevent us from hearing your word tonight. Lord, let all those that are watching or listening, Lord, hear with a very understanding heart. May you give us a simple but yet powerful message from God to your children in these last days. Thank you, Father. And may we praise you even in the midst of the storm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Verse 1 and 2 explain this is a personal letter from Paul the Apostle to Timothy, a younger minister in the faith. This also happens to be the very last letter that Paul wrote before his death. In the last chapter, it says things like, I am now ready to be poured out like a drink offering. I've run my race. I've finished my course. He was ready to go on and meet the Lord because he knew his time was short. But he begins this letter on a very personal note to young Timothy. It'd be like, kind of like if I was out on my travels and going across America and I uh, me and Eric was doing a road trip and I, I would come across a church in Texas and I said, Brother, I, want, I just feel like the Lord will leave you here and God put it on your heart. And, and, and back here before I came to my deathbed, I, I felt led to write a personal letter to you as a, a younger brother and friend in Christ to encourage you. And, and my, my own father even shared with me a thought before service. He said, what a strange place to get a word of encouragement from a letter from prison. You'd think it would be the other way around. The church would be writing to the inmates trying to encourage them, but here we have a case of the inmate writing to the church. Paul, unique cat, wasn't he? Paul was excited to be a Christian sitting on death row. Now, does that mean he didn't have some bad days? No, I'm sure he had bad days. Second Corinthians, he writes about the thorn in the flesh and he prayed three times that God would take it away because he just couldn't handle it. And God said, I got this, son. 
I got a purpose in that thorn. That's right. My grace is sufficient. Well, by now, Paul, who has grown in the Lord, and he's sitting in prison awaiting a death sentence, and we find out through church history that later he was put to death there in Rome. But he sits there on his last days or months or years, and he writes this very personal letter to young Timothy. In his first chapter, I think he deals with some things that can help me and you about living with freedom from fear. We live in a very fearful time. There are cities where it's not safe to walk outside on the streets after dark or even during the daytime. There's places that you and I, even in our own county here, would be afraid to go at certain times. I remember picking up a, a hitchhiker one night, and as, actually as I was leaving the church one Saturday night, a guy strolled up and he needed some help, and I felt, just to be honest with you, I felt like if I didn't take him somewhere, he's going to break in something around here. So I gave him a ride, and I took him down to a place that I won't say where, but it was bad enough. I got a phone call from an ex-convict the next day saying, Pastor, did I see your car at such and such place last night? I said, yeah. He said, man, don't you ever come down here. He said, this ain't the place for a white boy to be. Don't you ever come down here in the middle of the night again. He said, I want you to know that ain't safe, man. And he called me up. Folks, this world we're living in ain't as safe as we like to think it is. And then top of all that, they throw in a coronavirus. They throw in a little pandemic and they try to get us frightened to death to be able to go and worship together. It's scared to death to come and ill just to hug one another's neck in God's house. We're so afraid of a little pandemic and it's like we don't think God can handle that thing or something. Now I do believe that God's word tells us to obey the, the, the powers that be. Yes, God put them in, in a place but I also believe we need to live not because of fear but because of faith. So I want to share with you about four things from the verses that I read that I think will help you in living with fear. But before I do, I want to share a story with you. I'm a history buff. I love old Western stories. That's one of the things I love about traveling out west. I love to go to places, the grave sites of, of some of the places where Custer was killed, where Wild Bill and, and Calamity Jane were buried and on top of Deadwood. I, I love going to places like this. But there was a fellow in the Old West that kind of sticks out. Let me read a couple of facts about him. He, he went by the name of Black Bart. You've probably heard of him. He was one of the most successful outlaws in the Old West. He successfully held up 29 stagecoaches. No victim ever saw his face because he wore a hood that hid his face. No sheriff ever was able to track his trail. He never even fired a single shot or took a single hostage. He didn't have to. His intimidating presence put everyone in such a state of fear that they automatically gave all their valuables away. The story goes on to say that, that Black Bart conquered people in the name of fear. You know something, folks? We live in a day and time when the enemy's greatest weapon against the church is fear. And I sometimes like to use the example that as a Christian, I am walking down uh, uh, the middle of a street. Let's use this uh, alleyway right here as an example. I am walking down the middle of a street, and on each side there are buildings with demons screaming at me, reaching for me, trying to grab me. But as long as I keep in the middle of the street with my eyes on Jesus, I am perfectly safe. But when I take my eyes off Jesus and steer to the right, I can be caught. When I take my eyes off the Lord and steer toward the fear, I can get in trouble. But when I keep my walk straight, and my eyes on Christ. They can hoop and holler and grab all they want. They can't get a hold of me unless I make the wrong turn and go to the wrong place. Today, I'm telling you, as a Christian, we live in scary times, but my God says don't live in fear. Hey, he's given us something better than that to live in today. Amen. Four things I want to share with you. First of all, prayer. Verse number three says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with a pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. You know, if there's one thing an inmate has time to do is pray. I, I'm going to tell you a true story. You might think I'm crazy, but I've got a lot of guys that would back this up. I've had numerous guys tell me in prison, 
I'm so glad God let me get locked up. It gave me time to pray. It gives me time to study the word because when I was out on the street, I spent my time chasing desires and pleasures and things that got me in trouble. But thank God he put me in prison where I had time to pray. Can I ask you a question tonight, church? Do we love the Lord enough that if uh, we don't pray like we should now, that we'd be okay with God putting us in prison so we would have time to pray? He says, I pray without ceasing day and night. But the very first thing he says in verse three is, I pray thankfully. I thank God whom I serve. Folks, our prayers need to be thankful prayers. If you're not real careful, you're gonna wind up getting into the old uh, routine of only praying when you need something, only praying when your back's against the wall, only praying when you're in a desperate spot or hurting or broken. Folks, I'm telling you, we need to come before God on the good days and be thankful. Praise his name. We just sang that old song, I will praise you in the storm. Hey, can't we just smile in the storm as well? God said be thankful. And by the way, before you tell me your problems, Paul's on death row, remember? Be amazed how many times we've walked into prison camp. And I would be weary from doing funerals, be weary from counseling, weary from running up and down hospital hallways. And I'd walk in out there just about too tired and to not even really be honest with you, didn't even feel like going to worship. Walk on the camp and those inmates' enthusiasm. They're so excited to see you. They're so thankful that somebody took time out of their schedule to walk behind the bar. So thankful that somebody cared to bring the word. Honey, I could care less how tired or how wore out you are. That'll charge your batteries being around thankful people. And sometimes church can be a pretty boring place to go because it's filled with pretty contrary folk, amen. If we'd be thankful and enjoy what God has given us and be thankful to the Lord, more folk would want to hang around, amen. Amen. I thank God whom I serve. He's a continual prayer. It was an earnest prayer. Look at verse four. He says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of my tears. Oh, he talks about, oh, I, I want to see you again, Timothy. I've wrote you this letter to tell you I love you and I'm praying for you, but I've got a desire to come and see you if it be the Lord's will. Then the last part of verse four says this, that I may be filled with joy. Can I tell you something? He says he wants to be filled with joy. That tells me when he writes the first of verse three about being thankful, he may not have been filled with joy right then, but he was still being thankful. You can be thankful without being joyful but I don't know that you can be joyful without being thankful because we got so much to be thankful for. Paul said, folk, if you want to live in freedom from fear, it, it begins by having a prayer life. And I've used this stat before. I read once upon a time that the average Christian prays less than 30 seconds a day and the average pastor prays less than two minutes a day. And we wonder why there's no power in the pulpit. We wonder why there's no power in the house of God anymore. We wonder why there's no joy in the aisles. Folks, we need to spend time before Almighty God. And you know what? I dare say we spend more time in front of Fox News or CNN than we do before God giving thanks and rejoicing today. And that's one reason we're so bound up by fear today. We spend a whole lot more time doing things away from God than we ever do thinking about spending time with God. Well, first thing we need to do is work on our prayer life. But I'll give you a second thing that'll help you in freedom from fear, and that's our faith. Look at verse five. It says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, and that means the genuine, the sincere faith that is in thee, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. He's talking about a sincere faith that was taught from generation to generation. And we live in a time today where the new generation don't want to listen to the old generation no more. They seem to think that they've all got it figured out. No offense to our young folks, but I wish I was 18 and had all the answers again because I'm telling you, the older I get, the, the more questions I get that I just don't have very many answers. Oh, if you'd have seen me when I was about 20, I had all the answers, amen, I can tell you. But as we grow in this old world, we begin to find out life is a little more complicated than you can possibly imagine. But one thing's for sure about old Timothy. 
he had a heritage of faith in his family. His mama and his grandmama put inside of him the faith that when the going gets tough, he knew where to go to the foot of the cross. And folks, I'm telling you today in America, we have a tradition, a heritage to father that our parents, our grandparents, and your great-grandparents have set before us. And I know we live in a day and time where folks are wanting to do away with history and tear down statues and all that stuff. But I want you to understand something. The Bible says remove not the ancient landmarks that are placed before us. In other words, remember the faith of our fathers and forefathers of this nation. This country was built on faith, not fear. And I'm telling you, it takes men of God to stand up and be the leaders of our families, to lead by faith and not by fear. And that kind of faith is handed down through a heritage from mama to grandson or from mama to grandmama and on back down. You name the relationship. If you trust God, it's going to have an effect on the rest of your family today. But let me ask you a question. To the young generation that don't want to bring your family to church, what are they going to have to fall back on when they're old? I remember visiting with my father when I was a younger man many times and I've heard him say something just like this in many different forms and to many different families. You got children? Yes, sir. He'd say something. He'd say, sometimes these exact words he'd say, you ought to be ashamed of yourself not raising them youngins in God's house. I said he told a, a, a police officer that one time he was about to get a ticket. Daddy got the witness and told him, and and so he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And the cop said, hold on, I'm supposed to be scolding you. And he didn't even get a ticket out of it, you know. But what he's saying is, folks, hey, there was a time when you could look at a man or a woman and say, it's your responsibility to raise your kids in God's house. But nowadays, I'm afraid we've got a generation of parents that wasn't raised in God's house themselves. And so therefore they got no desire nor any knowledge of how to lead their children. And as bad as that looks now and as bad as our society has become, you multiply that by two or three more generations and just imagine how rough it can be. But folks, I'm telling you, our faith is something that we need to hand down from generation to generation. Then I want you to notice here in verse number six, it says this. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He's saying to young Timothy here, he says, son, verse six, I need to remind you of something. I need to stir you up to remembrance. Let me tell you the value of the stir, okay? If any of y'all ever done much camping, and a lot of us country boys do, when you get up first thing in the morning on a cold winter morning, First thing you got to do after you hit the bushes, first, second thing you have to do is get back and stir that fire up because it may be smoldering. It might only be a little puff of smoke barely coming. It may not even be anything but just the ember there. But you know what? You've got one of two choices. You can leave it alone and it'll extinguish it or you can stir around in it a little bit and it'll heat it up. And if you stir around and put a little fresh uh, uh, kindling on it, guess what? It'll ignite. So I'm going to ask you today what verse 6 is talking about this. I want to remind you, church, that God said we needed a little stirred up, okay? Let me put it to you in terms you can understand. 2020 is stirring us up. Huh? We've had hurricanes. By the way, there's more coming this way, they said, on the news today. We've had earthquakes right here in North Carolina, 5.1. We've had multiple earthquakes. We've got all kinds of natural disasters taking place. Says, man, we've got floods. We couldn't even get to the river Sunday to baptize because the whole parking lot was underwater from a flood. But praise God, we're still able to have a baptism out here. Folks, I'm telling you, we're living in a day and time when we've got fear all around us. But my God said, had faith in him. And he wants to stir us up a little bit and say this to you. Hey, youngins, there was a time that your forefathers were discouraged and were fearful and didn't know where to turn. And I stirred them up a little bit. And you know what? The revival flames begin to uh, begin to ignite and today church we're getting stirred up in this year we're living in and the question remains will we be ignited or will we be extinguished as a church God's doing his part now it's our time to make a decision 
what you going to do? How much more does God need to stir us up? There's a third thing I'm going to share with you. Freedom from fear. Well, we got prayer and we got faith. But thirdly, we got some gifts. Look at verse 7. God give us some gifts. Verse 7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear. Thank God fear is not one of the gifts, okay? Fear does not come from the Father. But he gives us three things that are. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The word power means there's power in the blood. And all that precious shed blood that saved my soul from hellfire is the same precious shed blood that can save that addict from an addiction. It's the same precious shed blood that can take that demon-possessed person and give them deliverance today. It's that same blood of Jesus that dropped off Calvary's cross that has the power to transform the church today if we'll just submit to him and say, Dear God, here I am. I desire the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not in anything you and I can do. It's only in, in what God can do. God says, I'll give you power if you'll let me. But you know what the second gift is? Love. Love. Don't we live in a world that's forgot what love is? We live in a world that has no idea what godly Christian love looks like anymore. And that's a crying shame. Love. I think true love has to come with some forgiveness. And let me share something. We, we talked about God's power. I can't. Only God can. When it comes to love and forgiveness, I can't. Only God can. You might look at me and say, Preacher, you don't know what they've done to me. I can't forgive them. And you know what? You're probably right. And without God's help, no, you can't. But with God, all things are possible. Ain't that what Philippians says, brother? You're teaching through it on Sunday morning. With God, all things are possible. So, folks, we need to sometimes just turn it over to God. But then he says a third gift here, power and of love and of a sound mind. Sound mind means self-control or discipline. In other words, quit listening to everything CNN and Fox is telling you and start listening to what Almighty God is trying to tell us. I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Ain't nothing wrong with you watching the news if you'll spend twice as much time reading the Word. Do me that, huh? Because if you do that, you won't be nearly as afraid about what the news just said to you. But you'll be a whole lot more rejoicing on what God has to say. And by the way, this Word that was written thousands of years ago is more up to date than the 6 o'clock news was just a while ago on a TV station. So it gives us a sound mind to know what to believe and what to follow. There's one more thing I'd like to share with you in closing. He gave us prayer, he gave us faith, he gave us some gifts, and lastly, he gave us guts. Good old fashioned guts. It's time to stand up. Verse 8 says this Be thou, or be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 8 says, Have no shame in our Savior. No matter where you're at, no matter who you stand before, no, have, no matter what the odds are, don't ever be ashamed of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because he wasn't ashamed of me and you. Matter of fact, the Bible says, if you're ashamed of me before men, God says, I'll be ashamed of you before judgment. Hey, that's a scary thought. Do not be ashamed to be a Christian, even though it's not popular nowadays, even though the world may want to call you names and point fingers and everything else and laugh at you. Let them laugh. They've done the same thing to Jesus. That's That's okay. I know who gets the last laugh. Amen. He says, no shame of our Savior, but secondly, no shame of his saints. Paul, Peter says, excuse me, Paul says here, be not that be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner. And Paul said, I'm on death row. Just because I'm a convict, don't be ashamed of me either. You know what I found out about church? You're going to have to remember this one, brother. Wherever the Lord puts you in the ministry. When a church is willing to take the least of men, the homeless with a drug problem, the one who 
is filled with anger and hate and rage and has no money to go in the offering plate, don't have no fancy clothes to wear to church, the church that will accept that person, God will automatically throw in the best. Come on now. But for a church that only goes out here to reach the best of people, you only wind up with the fakes. God says you go and you get those that are hurting the worse. That's what Jesus done. You love reading the Gospels because seeing the Gospels, we get together on feast days when everybody goes up to the, uh, to the temple and they're showing their fancy new robes and their fancy gifts and all their money. We see Jesus down at the pool of Bethesda where the cripples are and there's no money to be taken up and he's down there healing people. And while they're up there having religion, God's down here having church, changing lives. So folks, I'm telling you today, that's what the Lord wants us to have, some guts to not be ashamed of our Savior, not be ashamed of your brother in Christ. I don't care who they may be or where they may live or what they may come from, other side of the tracks or whatever. Don't matter what color their skin. Don't matter how much money they make. If they make money, it doesn't matter. Love one another because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And lastly, in verse 8, it says, don't be ashamed of suffering. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. In other words, don't be ashamed to suffer for the gospel. When we're living in a day and time, we may have to make choices like that. Verse 9 says, and this closes it out, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. In other words, what he's saying is, it's through Jesus. Have you got Jesus? Whoever you are, wherever you're watching, if you're on the internet or on the radio or whatever, have you got Jesus in your heart? If you died tonight, do you know where you spent eternity? Because Jesus wants to save your soul if you're just willing to call out to him for salvation. But then you want you to know something. He gave us a calling in verse 9, a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his purpose and grace. You know what that tells me? Before the world began, before God even put Adam in the garden, he already had your life planned out to a T. And you know that mistake you made the other day and you thought you just messed everything up? 10,000 years ago, God already had that in his plan. He'd already allowed for my mistakes. Sometimes fear can cripple people. On that note, let me remind you. Remember Black Bart? When they finally tracked him down, let me tell you what they found. He wasn't really anything to be afraid of. When they tracked him down, they found a mild-mannered pharmacist from Decatur, Illinois. He was so afraid of horses that he rode to his robberies in a buggy. He was so afraid of firearms that he never loaded the guns that he robbed people with. And he was a meek, timid man. Sometimes fear can be very deceiving. Sometimes the enemy can be very threatening. Sometimes it's just a big disguise. And the cool thing is when we're willing to come and trust God, he's willing to take the disguise down and realize the only power in this world worth standing for is the almighty power of God. And tonight I pray that God will give us freedom from fear because the day we're living, these Christians just willing to stand up and fight for the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you just for letting us speak tonight for a few, night, few minutes on this subject. And Lord, as Paul was sitting on death row, you laid upon his heart to pencil those words. May they speak to our hearts that our prayer life and our faith life, Lord, will stand stronger than ever. Now, God, you'll give us the guts to stand in this day and time, no matter what people may think or say, they will be proud to be called a child of yours. And Lord, we sure thank you for watching over us, watching over our church family. And Lord, for those out there that's listening to this, maybe someone tonight will call out to you for salvation. Lord, you hear that prayer. You save that soul. And thank God you're still building your kingdom in these last days that we stand. Let us stand stronger than ever for your grace. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Folks, I appreciate you coming. If you need to come.